So I'm not going to give you 15, 20, or 30 steps. I'm only going to share with you my four steps. <coughs> my four step process that I use to get more traffic and converting that traffic into subscribers and then eventually getting a return on my investment, meaning money in my pocket. Uh, my goal is by learning from these four steps, you'll be able to experience the same results. And I'll be talking not just the bigger picture, hands-on case studies like how I took a one-year-old article on my website and within 24 hours got 30,000 shares. How a single Twitter change, a strategy change that I made on my tweets increased my daily traffic by 4,000 page views a day from Twitter. And by the end of this, I'm sure all of you will be implementing the same Twitter strategy on your site. And some on-site optimizations, which is very important, and things that I did that reduced my bounce rate from 70% to 39% and 45% range. Before we get into the four-step process, I want to talk about the problems that we have, understanding the problems that we have, understanding the workflow problems. A lot of times people think they don't have the problem because they have a workflow. They think they have a workflow, right? So let's look at the problems together. You write a great post. How many of you write a great post? <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> you think you're writing a great post. If your post ideas are not data driven, you're not writing a great post. You're writing what you think your audience wants to know. You're writing what you would like to know. You need to write about things that your audience wants to know. Write great articles, and we're gonna cover how to write great articles. Second problem, when you write something, you share it once. You share it on your Twitter, you share it on your LinkedIn, you share it on your Facebook, and then what? Nothing. As a business owner, you have very limited time to write, so you spend the time writing it and then only promoting it once and then leaving that article to die in your blog's archive pages? When was the last time you went on a website and said, let me see what this author wrote about one year ago? Never. The third part of the workflow problem, you got people to come to your website by sharing them once, but those people leave. So all that effort for nothing. Now you repeat the process all over again. Cool? I think you'll, you'll follow along as it's happening. And if you realize the problem, if you learn, you test, you improve, that's the key. Step one, creating a workflow. Now you may say, well, I have a workflow. Just because you do the same thing every day doesn't mean you have a workflow, right? Just because, oh, I run a blog post every day, I respond to emails, I have a workflow. No, workflows are systems that you put in place to get better. Things that makes you more efficient. So I have put in workflows that allows us to have very good support, allows me to prepare my content one month in advance, sometimes two months in advance. So let's take a look at what I do. My goal, I, well, that's the number one thing. You have to have goals. Not just long-term goals. Everybody has bigger picture goals. What's gonna happen to me? I would like to see myself here in three years or five years. What about next week? What's your goal for this week? What's your goal for today? When you're setting up a workflow, you should have a short-term goals that are eventually leading you to your long-term goals. First thing I use, because I do a lot of content, writing, marketing, a tool called Edit Flow in WordPress. If you're not using it, install it on your WordPress site, Edit Flow. It allows you to organize your content in different statuses, in different stages that they're in. If you have an idea, write it down. You're lying to yourself if you think you're gonna remember it. This tool allows you to do that, save it as a pitch. You have a writer, if you're working on it, assign it to yourself as accountability. If something is signed to you and you're not doing it, hold yourself accountable. Once, if you have multiple writers, you can assign it to that writer so they know that you, you know, it's not getting lost in emails. You can save it in pending review. A lot of, I have so many writers, so this tool is perfect because once they're done, they can save it in pending review. I review it or another editor reviews it and then it moves to the different status, ready to publish, and then somebody else can go and schedule that and go on. The other cool thing about this is the editorial calendar. Using this tool, I have like 
two months of posts that are ready to publish. So even if I go on a two month long vacation, my sites will still have content coming out. Communication, when you, when you have multiple writers, you're managing multiple writers, communication breaks down because you just have one long email thread that's talking about 10 different things. This allows you to discuss the issues within that post. So edit flow is a really, really cool tool. Number two, Asana. Anything that's not related to my articles, go in Asana. It's a task management, task management project management tool um, that you, you can use to improve your communication with your team, set up a workflow, set deadlines, assign it to the people, holding, having that kind of accountability. Really good. Between these two tools and your short-term goals and long-term goals, you should be able to create a workflow that works for your business. Step two, smart content planning. All right. In order for you to get traffic, you need to be really smart about the content you're writing because you, we all have very limited time. If you want to use your time wisely, you got to write a great article. So what makes a great article? Shout it out. What makes a great article? What do you think is a good article? Keyword research. Keyword research. So a good article is the one that people are searching for. If your customers are searching for it and they find it on your website, you got that customer's trust. A good article is the one that solves a problem. Here's one thing I learned over the, over the decade. Is if you can help somebody solve a problem, you earn their trust. And earning somebody's trust is almost like having their credit card number in your pocket. A good, if you can solve your customer's problem, that's a good article. <coughs> And when you do the first two, your good article gets shared a lot. So how do I go about making a decision on what article I want to write about? I stop and listen. I stop and listen to my users. And there are a few tools that I use to do that. Number one, the Google Keyword Planner. This tool was created by Google for their advertisers. So advertisers can spend money and bid on the right keywords. Content marketers have started using it for a completely different reason. We look at what are the keywords that are being most searched for in our industry. You go look at all the articles that have been written about it, and chances are you're going to look at it and you're like, this is crap. I think I can do a better job. Sometimes writing an unoriginal content gets you a, more, a higher return on investment. You know you're more qualified to write about that topic, and you think you can do a better job than the ones that are being ranked, which is mostly like Wikipedia, or about.com, or ehow.com. Sure, we, we can all do a better job than those. Now you're going to write about the thing that people are actually searching for. Your customers are actually searching for. That solves their custom, your customers' problems. Google Keyword Planner. The second tool is KeywordTools.io. Gives you the same thing as, um, as the Google Keyword, but it gives you Bing, YouTube, and the App Store. And I'll talk about YouTube a little bit more because I'm very involved in it. I have a channel with like 220 million views and we'll talk about how I built that and use that to drive traffic to my site as well. But keyword tool.io, similar tool, but you don't need a Google account for that. Search.twitter.com, by far my most favorite tool. I can type any topic in there and then just watch. Now, if, you're, if, if you don't know about this thing, there's an advanced search. If you see the link up there, that's advanced search. If, you, if you're gonna look at like WordPress as a topic, Chances are you're going to see all the spam, all the spam links, 30 best themes, and then the same guy has like 50 different accounts and he's just ha spamming the hashtag. But by going under advanced search, if you, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can choose the sentiment of the tweet. Is it a positive tweet, neutral tweet, negative tweet, or is it a question? We want to solve a problem for our users. Let's look at the questions our audience is having. So I'll go into advanced search and I'll click on questions, and now, I eliminate all the spam. I filter the Twitter feeds. I would reply to those people with the answer, or I will go write an article about that answer and then reply to them. Like, wow, this one company is on top of their game. Helps you earn the trust. Once you're writing the article, hopefully you have enough ideas, you have to write a magnetic headline. Why? Because we're all shallow people, right? <laughs> We judge the book by its cover, and we judge the blog post by its title. If you, if you think any, anything else, you're lying to yourself. And you're just lying to other people too. 
to write magnetic headlines. The tool that I use is called EMV Headline Analyzer. Just type it in Google, EMV Headline Analyzer. Give you the emotional value of the title that you have. If your title can trigger some sort of emotion, it will get clicked. And I know that because I run viral sites, the ones that you see on Facebook that are getting shared like 2,000 or 10,000 or 30,000 times. And that's how it goes. If you can get the score of 30 to 40 by just changing certain words in there, that title is gonna get shared a lot. It's a good reference point. Don't obsess yourself over it. Good reference point. Copyblogger.com has a phenomenal ebook that talks about writing great titles. Actually, they have, they have, they had like nine or ten different articles that they combine into a free ebook. Gives you all the good examples, title formulas. I highly recommend checking that out um, as well. What's Copyblogger.com. They have a ebook that talks about writing great headlines. Once you have written this amazing article, you can't ignore the SEO. You don't need to go out, build backlinks, or any of that. Just do one step, at, one thing at a time. Focus on the page analysis. Yoast SEO plugin, WordPress SEO by Yoast. A lot of people install it on their site, they never use it. Look at this page analysis tab on the top, and it will give you an idea how easy is your article to read. The more conversational your article is, the better it is. It's gonna rank in search. The easier it is to read, the better it is gonna convert for you. So this gives you an idea on how search engines are seeing your article. Now, hopefully by this time you have an article that your users are searching for and that solves the user's problem. Now you have to get to getting it shared a lot. That's part three of the process. Effective social sharing. And I'll spend a lot of time on this particular um, topic and then the next one. Rookie mistake, I mentioned it earlier. People write a blog, share it once or twice, and then leave it to die. Let's not do that, guys. If you value your money, if you value the marketing efforts you're putting in, don't do that. Here's a, here's a cool tool called Bulk Buffer. How many of you have heard of Buffer app? Oh, good, good folks. So Buffer, does, Buffer has this one problem. It doesn't allow you to bulk schedule things. Chances are things that you're writing, not all of them are great, but at least 20, 30% of the articles that you have are, are good for at least one month, two months, three months. Create a spreadsheet, upload it to Bulk Buffer, use Bulk Buffer to upload it to buffer.com or bufferapp.com. And then you can schedule those tweets. So before I would only share like one article twice a day. Now we share one new article, one new video, and then four of our older articles, whether that is from the glossary or whether that is from you know, other, other popular blog posts, and you share it. Why? Because not all of your users on Twitter are online at the same time. The different time zones, they live in different areas. Two, there's so much noise in that feed, if you post like five minutes ago, chances are they're not gonna see it, depending on the amount of people they're following. So this keeps your brand up there. Your engagement goes higher because now, once they see one article, they're gonna reply to you, you get, you're getting more post ideas, their followers are seeing it, if they're favoriting it, if they're retweeting it. So, bulk buffer. Now there is a tool called Tweet Old Post. I have used it in the past. I don't like automation to that extent because it just automatically share all the stuff that you have. It has some parameters, but I like to have more manual control of what I wanna share. Um, and I wanna use different hashtags, try to target different things in there. Second thing, change content formats. Most people don't do that. You wrote, you wrote a great post, you had, you had all the data, why not create a video about it? Why not create a podcast about it? So we created a video on List25. This channel started uh, three months after the launch of List25 in January of 2012. 2012, I believe, yeah. And um, essentially what we did, neither me or my partner, David, wanted to have our face on, on the camera because we're camera shy. All right, so we created what a glorified podcast. Essentially, David read the article, and for all the 25 images, he was just doing a slideshow. For every image, there was like two or three sentences he would read. That's all what our channel was. 
Today, we have 1.3 million subscribers on that channel and over 220 million views. Why? Because YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. And it's owned by the first largest search engine in the world. Whatever you post on YouTube is automatically going to rank higher in Google. Exposes you to that huge audience. And now more and more people are creating these screencasts and these audio, like, you know, whatever. If you have a podcast and you're uploading it to iTunes, you should be uploading it to YouTube as well. Because you're leveraging that network. Now, um, before, when you're doing it, look up the YouTube's creator playbook. When I started, YouTube didn't have it. But now the creator's playbook is, um, is a phenomenal resource. And the one thing that the creator's playbook will not tell you that a lot of the top YouTubers are doing is the end cards in your video. So you know when your video ends, there's like, hey, if you like this video, click here to subscribe and check out our other videos. And it's a screen, it's an image usually with a subscribe button and two video images, you can use annotations to link to those images, right? Um, so you link to your other videos and your subscribe button. Now instead of linking directly to your videos, link to a video that's inside a playlist. So first create a playlist in YouTube, and then link to that video and add an ampersand, playlist equals the playlist ID. Here's why you would do that. When your video ends, YouTube shows them its own related videos, right? It shows them, you know, maybe one or two videos of yours and the other six of your competitors. You don't ever want your user to go to your competitor's video, right? So now once they watch your first video, your end card was like, you know, 30 seconds or 20 seconds long, they click on that next video, they're, they're in the playlist. Now the YouTube will never show them a related video. When the video ends, it automatically plays your next video and your next video and your next video. The longer a user spends time on your channel, the better your engagement rate, the higher you're gonna rank in the YouTube search, and so on. One tip you can implement on all of your YouTube videos right now. I started doing that for WP Beginner earlier this year. Um, why, because I found somebody else who could make the videos, because I'm not the guy who's gonna make the video. And since May, we've had 10,000 subscribers on the channel now, and 700,000 views, so from May up until now. What did I do? We had so many great articles that were text. I said, hey, can you make these into screencasts? And I hired somebody to make all of my older articles into screencasts. Changing the content format. So you do the work once and then the next parts are just easier. You don't have to do the research again. Allows you to grow faster. If you're not leveraging YouTube right now, you're gonna miss out. Almost all the content marketers and social media marketers in the survey by social media examiners said that their focus in 2015 is YouTube. Gary Vaynerchuk is finally on YouTube too. And that, that might say something. Um, Derek Halpern has been doing a great job. And all of these other well-known bloggers are finally getting on YouTube. What does it mean to leverage it? Meaning to leverage it is to be, have your brand presence there. People are not using YouTube as a network, they're like, oh, I, sh I should have a Twitter, I'm gonna share my content on Twitter. I have a Facebook page, I should share my content on the Facebook page. But people are not really searching for you on Facebook. They're, they're often not searching for you on Twitter either. But people are searching YouTube for videos related to it. So if you leverage YouTube to bring people back to your business and earn their trust, that's what I mean by leveraging YouTube. Thank you. No problem. Uh, changing content formats on Facebook. A lot of times people just share the links. Why not just make an image out of it, make a tip out of it? So like I have this old article about the Favicon. So I said, tip of the week, do you have a Favicon? And these images usually get better shares. Now here's the next concept that probably will hit you guys really hard. This topic is not very heavily discussed. Digest it. Community is greater than brands. A lot of people are focused on building a brand. Building a brand around Joe's construction or Amy's wedding planning. You focus on the wrong thing. Because you're only, when you build a brand, you're only gonna hit, reach this much people. And when you build a community, your possible reach goes higher. To win in your social media, you have to be your industry, not just your brand. Let me tell you what I mean by that. How many of you have a Facebook page about your company? 
Twitter page about your company. Now, how many of you have a Facebook page that is something that's of interest to your community? One, two, and three. Wow, you guys are ahead of the game. So for List25, we do this very often. This is exactly how you make things go viral. So we have a page called List25, which doesn't have as many likes. But then we have other pages, the things that our audience is interested in. For example, they love science, so we have a page called Science Lovers Only. It's a community page. We have a page called Ghetto Children. And so on. Whatever the things that our audience wants to know about, we will create pages about that. Why? Because you're much more likely to like a page that says Science Lovers Only because you're like, yeah, I love science. I'll like it. It's a community. Versus liking List 25 because they feel like they're going to be sold to. Okay? It allows you to get more likes, more shares, and so on. Darren Rouse, a very popular blogger from Pro Blogger and Digital Photography School, started doing this recently as well. He had his digital photography school, but how many of you want to admit that you go to something called digital photography school, right? It's cool if you're a photographer, but all your friends are like, dude, why are you going to photography school? Didn't you know photography? But if he creates a page called, do you like photography? So you're going to say, yes, like. Triggers that emotion. It's a community. Now, Darren can share all of his stuff and other people's stuff without ever diluting the brand of Digital Photography School. As a matter of fact, if you really didn't want to own up to the fact that he owns Do You Love Photography, you would never know that he runs Do You Love Photography. He can build a community of millions and millions of users without you ever knowing who's the real owner. You are your industry at that point. If you're a wedding planner and you have, you have a page about funny wedding videos, or the best proposal videos, best proposal ideas, things that have mass appeal, you'll reach more people. Do you change the content on each one of those sites? Of course, you change the content, you, you're sharing everybody else. So you're like, why am I going to promote my competitor? Because you're not your brand there. You're your industry. You will promote your competitor there as well. That's what builds trust. If, you, if, if, if you're constantly sharing your own stuff, you, people are like, this is a sellout page. But if you're, if you're promoting everybody else, you're your industry. Here's an example. We posted this uh, article or this image on our uh, List25 page, posted by my sister sitting right here. Um, it's our first WordCamp. But here's what we did. After we shared it on our List25 page, we reshared a List25 photo from all of our other pages. Now the reach of that photo started going crazy. That one photo, now Facebook thinks it's really cool, so we have what, like 158,000 uh, likes on it and 2,000 2, shares. You can really make your things go viral. If you don't do it every day, if you do it once a month, every two weeks, that's more eyeballs your business will ever see for paying how much? Zero dollars in advertisement. Zero dollars. Now you're like, well, I'm a local business. Why would I want to create a page that appeals globally? I'm sure you guys have heard of Facebook ads, right? When you go target a Facebook ad just based on interest, it's very expensive. But you already know that you have captured the interest in your page. Targeting your page audience is like 20% like 20 of the actual cost. So if some, somewhere you're paying 30 cents, 40 cents, here you'll be paying 5 cents, 7 cents for leads in the United States, in your local area, because you can geo-target. You decrease your customer acquisition cost. And that's the way. You have to be your industry. You can do this on Twitter as well. I'm doing it on Twitter. It gets phenomenal response. Retweets, favorites are all high. But did you take that picture with the women or was it like real? No, this, 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 is, this is a picture that you find. That's why the credit is there. I didn't claim that I own this picture. I gave full credit to the other person. So, next thing when you're in the effective social sharing stage is always test your titles. People are like, well, how do I test titles on my WordPress blog? Sure, there are plugins like Neil UAB testing and all that, but it's a lot easier to test on Facebook or Twitter. All you gotta do is change the message before and just add a link. Use Google UTM trackers and you're good, right? And Facebook, when you upload an image, you can bring your mouse over it and the title will become like yellow and if you click on it, you can change the title to whatever the heck you want. You can change the description to whatever the heck you want. Test it out, share an image, same, same article, three weeks, 
like you know, split apart different days, see which one is getting the best results. If something is getting really, really good results, you change the title on your website and try to bring that article to the top. That brings me to the topic of on-site optimization. Here's a funny fact. Most websites convert less than 2%. That's sales. So what's happening to the other 98% of the people? They're leaving your website. You know what's happening to the percentage of people who are leaving your website? More than 70%, if not all of them, are never gonna come back to your website. So you spend all the money, all the time, all the effort in promoting your content to bring the person once and then they leave your website, you go back and do all of that again. It's like you love wasting money. So let's talk about how do you keep the people on your website for more than one page because when they go on multiple pages, the chances of them converting goes higher. How do you get them to take another action aside from just buying your service? Maybe they subscribe to your newsletter or whatnot. So let's discuss that. How do you spend your money wisely and keep the user on the site? One thing, popular post. Highlighting the popular post on your site is pretty cool, right? How many of you have a popular post widget? Quite a few. You're most likely using a popular post plugin. You know what's the problem with a popular post plugin? It's automated. It highlights the posts that are already popular. Chances are when somebody's coming to your website, they're already coming to that post. It allows you to make any post popular. So all of these articles that you see on the left are not popular. <laughs> Does that make sense? The yellow up there is just ugly, right? When you, this, this yellow, people are like, dude, why is that so ugly? Why, your website looks pretty. Why is there that yellow, ugly thing? Because it stands out. See, when somebody comes to your website, they read in the F pattern until they see something ugly and the F pattern goes up and they look right there. They're like, uh, -huh. I'm gonna click on that the article gets shared a lot more. This is what I did with this article, 25 most brutal torture techniques ever devised. It had like 200 or 300 shares. Um, it was a year old article. I was getting, another one of my articles was getting a lot of traffic, so I decided to put this at the top of the most popular post. Within 24 hours, over 30,000 shares on this article. You can do this with uh, Neilio featured posts and there's several other plugins that allow you to do featured posts, right? But WordPress widget, allows you to title it whatever the heck you want. You can say popular post, you can say things going viral or whatever the heck you want. Now, I did this again, just recently, with 25 coldest American cities you wanna avoid. Look at the share count there. 148,000 times, I think it might be higher now. It took like, what, 72 hours. This is an article that's two weeks old, nobody really cared about it, it went down in the archives. But another article started getting shared last, so I put this at the top because it was timely. I do this on WP Beginner as well. At the end of the article, it says other things you should be reading. It doesn't pull related posts. It pulls the things that I want you to read. Related posts, chances are my, this post should have answered every question that you have. I can link to related posts from within my article just interlinking. I don't need to give you a list of posts at the end. Once you're done reading, I want you to take an action. I want you to go read another article on my site. Here's the hand-picked related post. And these says things that are going viral right now. That's where you show possibly the same list that you're showing on the sidebar with your featured post. Because if somebody missed the sidebar, they're gonna come to your popular post area or related post area. By doing this, I was able to increase my visitors from one page to five pages of visit. One page to five pages of visit. On average user spend on list 25, eight minutes. And our bounce rate decreased to 36%. Because I was able to suck them into the thing. WP Beginner's bounce rate is actually 50% for a tech site, it's pretty good. It's really, really good. Now the other thing you can do is popular post roundups. You have a lot of topics that you've written about that are in the same general category or tag, why not create a post and just list all of those articles? So we do one every year, best of best WordPress tutorials of 2013. Usually when somebody comes to that post, they go check out so many of the other posts. Our pages per viewed, um, you know, pages per visitor goes up significantly in December because we do this post always in December. Every time we do a post like, you know, eight best jQuery tutorials, this might be the jQuery tutorials we wrote 
about in a two month period, a three month period, we combine them all, bring them, highlight all of them again. What does it take for you to list your own articles? Very little effort, not a lot of research has to be done. It gets you a lot of traffic and you keep the users there because you're interlinking. Got to build an email list. People are like, well, Syed, isn't email dead? Isn't social the thing? Shouldn't I be on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter or, and whatever have you? It, email is by far the most reliable form of communication and that's why all the social networks know it too. You cannot have a Facebook account without having an email. Why not? Why does Facebook require you to have an email? Because they realize that this is still the most reliable, most effective, most direct, most personal form of communicating with the customer. I've been doing this for quite some time. MySpace came and gone. Plark was there and nowhere. FriendFeed was there, gone. Twitter is here today. Five years from now, I can't guarantee Twitter is going to be there. Or Facebook. Or Instagram. I don't know. So you're spending all your money building your platform on a separate site. You should spend all your, all your money, all your efforts building your blog, which is the heart that pumps the blood to your veins, which is your Twitter, your Facebook, and all that, and combine all of those users, bring them in your email list, because that's something that you own forever. Unless Gmail goes away, then we're all screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you build an email list? One, content upgrades and freebies. You've seen freebies a lot, but what's the, what the heck is a content upgrade? You wrote this amazing post about eight things you should be looking for when you're buying a lake property on the lake. Say you're a realtor. At the end of it, you say, click here to download my free 15 point checklist before you buy your lake home. After you give them the eight, which I'm hoping is really good content, you add seven more and put that into an ebook. You know how easy it is to create an ebook? How many of you know how to use a Microsoft Word? <laughs> There's a button called Save as PDF. That's all. You don't have to give them a .doc file. You save, save it as PDF and you give it away. I built a tool just to do this for myself. And now that tool is being used by tens of thousands of people. Opt-in Monster. Allows you to, when somebody clicks on it, a pop-up shows up, like enter your name and email, you receive that freebie. Or you can give them a very generic freebie. right? One of the guys, one of the developers do it, is um, my toolbox, Michael Hyatt does it, Thomas uh, right here, he does it. Like here is my toolbox of WordPress plugins and things that I use on my site and all the clients are like, I want a list of all those plugins. I mean, we all have our favorite tools, why not give it to our clients? It's as easy as typing some words in Microsoft Word and save it as PDF. Add multiple forms to collect emails. People often just add a sidebar form or a form that's on the after the post, but they have no data on which form is converting the best. Right? Your team come with a sidebar form. You think you should have a sidebar form because every other website has a sidebar form. Just because every other website has a sidebar form doesn't mean you should have a sidebar form. Right? You gotta try out different things. You gotta try something that slides from the bottom right hand corner. Something that's is sticky at the top, like a hello bar. Something that's at the, you know, at the bottom of the bar. A time pop, exit intent pop, up anything you could think of that captures the attention, you gotta do that. Lastly, you keep testing. Test, test, test. You learn from your test, you improve the process. If you don't do that, you're stuck, you're gonna be left behind, your competitor is gonna come in, kick you out, then you're gonna be wondering what happened. Use Google Analytics if you're not. If you're using Google Analytics, make an effort to check it every week. A lot of people have it installed, they don't know. They go, oh, I have this many visitors. They never go beyond the dashboard screen. Where did those users come from? What did they do when they came to your website? Having those kind of insights will help you grow. You know? So test, learn, and improve. Thank you. We have like 10 minutes or five minutes uh, for questions. Five, 10 minutes, go for it. Um, what do you use to check your A-B testing on site? 
So the question was, what do I use to A-B test the materials on my site optimizely? Um, is, is it great tool, optimizely? Yep. Go for it. Uh, how do you feel about retargeting? Do you do any retargeting? Retargeting is amazing if you, if you have conversion tracking set up. A lot of people hear the buzzword retargeting and they go set up a campaign in AdRoll or Facebook. They even set up a Facebook tracking pixel, but they don't really know like you know what what are they what their goal is. If you have the goal set up, if you have the right conversion goals, if you're using Kiss Metrics or Google Analytics conversion and set up properly, and you can measure the cost per acquisition, it works. Hey, if you if you spend ten dollars to make twenty dollars, I'll do it any day, right? But if you're spending twenty dollars to make eighteen, you gotta think about it. Go for it. Very quickly, um, at the very end when you were talking about test, learn, improve, you said use. At the very, very end, you said use, and I didn't catch what you said. You I was talking about Google Analytics. Use Google Analytics? That's right. Okay. And I really mean by using it. Don't just install it and forget about it. That, that's, that's the biggest problem. A lot of beginners they install it, um, and then they forget about it. Go for it, and then we'll go back there. Thank you. Yep. Um, how do you, what criteria do you use on posting and sharing your older <coughs> content? Because something we've run into is we'll get complaints from people. If it's even a month or two old, they'll say, well, why are you promoting this old stuff? Well, so here's one thing. We show the last updated date on our articles because we actually go back and update a lot of our articles because running WP Beginner means things go you know, stale pretty quick. So we go update a lot of the articles. If the article is good and it's gonna help people, chances are you're not gonna get that much um, you know, flashback. But if, you, if you're sharing like really, really old article that's outdated, yeah, that's, that's why I stopped using tweet old posts. Because when I was using tweet old posts, the, th the thing would automatically share Black Friday deals from 2012. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? And then like, automation fail, and I got like hundreds of tweets just like automation fail. So just, just, just be realistic about what your audience is looking for. I don't know how to set a criteria for a content that I didn't build. Go for it. Um, Jetpacks uh, publicize. Do you recommend that for uh, blogging? And if so, do you think it should go to free social media, if it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter? I mean, I try, whenever I share the content, I, sh I share it manually. I don't use the Jetpack Publicize. I actually log in my Hootsuite and I, I curate the title. Sometimes my blog post title might not be the best title for my Facebook. Maybe my, in my Facebook, I'm like, were you looking to do that? Or do you know you could do this in WordPress? And that's, that's all what the status is. Because the link embed is, actually, is showing them the title, showing them the image. Why do I need to repeat myself? See, Publicize is not smart enough to do that yet. So that's why I, I, I go the manual route. I try to automate as much as I could, but some things I still like to have the personal feeling. Go for it. You say you have, had, uh, I mean, you treat the, the, the popular post and you can pick all this. How do you do that? Manually? Every, every post? We have a same widget that's, that's running across, um, throughout, throughout the site, okay? And we're testing, we're testing basically, okay, let's, let me put it, these 10 articles because I've tested on Twitter, I've tested on Facebook, I've tested on Instagram, seeing which one is getting really good results. And then I bring that article back up with a new title because I've, I've done those title experiments that is working out on Facebook. So I bring that article back up to the top um, and that's it. Um, there, there's a plugin called Neilio Featured Post that does that. Um, we built something in-house it does exactly the same thing. Neelio Featured Post would, would do the exact same thing. Neelio Featured Post. But if you go in WordPress.org plugins and type Featured Post, most Featured Post plugins will allow you to do that. Some will make it easier than inserting post IDs. Others would you know, require you to enter post IDs. Go for it. How would you apply these techniques to a very specific uh, targeted demographic, like a college campus? Like a college campus, what are you? What, what's it depend on what your goals are. If you're a small, you can apply the same technique to any small business, whether you are a wedding planner, whether you are a plumber, whether whether you are anything else, you can apply it. I don't know what what you're trying to do with the college campus, so just provide news. To provide news. Well, the easiest way is you can target the college campus on any Facebook ads, right? But I don't, I don't really know. But what, if you're just providing news, what's your goal? With everything that I promote, I have an end goal. Whether that is to get them in my email list, whether that is to get them, well, once I get them in my email list, my goal is to sell them a product that is in that space. So everything that I'm doing, it has to deal with 
my return on the revenue. Does that make sense? I saw a hand up there. Go for it. Um, is there any perfect level of personal interest? Like when you're doing these keyword searches, if you, if you love something too much, you tend to write what you're interested in. If you don't love it at all, you tend to get bored. So is there kind of a perfect mental attitude toward your um, subject? And to piggyback on that, how long should these posts would be. I mean, I know there's... Sure. I, I, I wouldn't say that there's like a character limit on a post. Once you're done writing, you're done writing. If you think you've covered the topic, you've covered the topic. Some of my articles are 300 words. Others are 4,000 words. Right? It, it depends on what your goal was with that post. Have you accomplished it? If so, 300, 500 words is fine. The more, the more research you do, the better. In terms of getting back to your question, how do you determine personal interest and what the customer's interest? Again, that was the first problem, right? You write great content because you think you want to write that content. In most cases, your blog, if it's not a personal blog, it is, you're writing for the user. So you write what the user wants. And if, if you're not interested in that topic, you have to reclassify your niche that you're in. You have to rethink that. There's a question back there. Well, in reverse to YouTube, you are talking about earlier, on the right-hand side, you have the list. Mm -hmm. what, what was that called again? In the, in, when I was talking about YouTube? I was, talk, I was talking about the end cards and the playlist. End cards, yeah. You, YouTube Creators Playbook Guide will talk about the end cards, but they won't tell you that in the end cards, in the annotations, at the end of the video URL, you just add ampersand playlist equals the playlist ID. If you add that, you will increase the view, video viewed by your users. Okay? Get that formula again, what you just said. Yeah, it's the YouTube URL, ampersand, like the and symbol, Playlist equals the ID of the playlist that you have. Okay, we have like one more question. Go for it. Um, as a young entrepreneur, entrepreneur, how do you go from you have this great idea and you want to make themes or you want to start just a web design business? How would you sit down and actually plan out? Like you have your brand identity. How do you plan out maybe how to write uh, articles that would kind of sync back to how to promote the themes or services? I, start to yeah. So how do you plan out if, you, if you're targeting a specific audience? A lot of times when I ask a question, who's your audience? They're like, well, everybody's my audience, right? That's, that's, that's the biggest problem. Hone in. My audience is CPAs, okay? I'm going to build websites. I can build any type of website, but I'm going to target CPAs. Or I'm going to target lawyers. Target that one specific demographic. See what your results are there. You're writing questions that they're, they're having. How do I add a financial calculator on my website? How do I add a tax form on my website? How do I increase my lead gen? And you, you just focus on that one topic. So you can have kind of your umbrella. Your umbrella. That's right. That's right. That all That's right. Okay. Yep. And when you, when, you, when, you, when you hone into one audience, you, you're likely going to grow from, from there with just word of mouth. Another way is just when you're starting out, just take the filler work from other agencies because they, they have more work than they can handle a lot of times. So they subcontract it out. Build up your experience there and when you're working out the contract deal, just try to see that if you can showcase that work. And if you do that, you're good. Thank you. All right, I think my time is up, but I want to leave you guys with one thing. Don't think Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any of these networks as like ind independent things or I'm going to buy traffic from Google or Facebook. It's all connected. The only way you're going to really increase your traffic subscribers revenue if you, if you connect all of that from content planning to effective social sharing to having a workflow to on-page optimization. It's, those all have to go together in, in order for those to work. Thank you.